Good morning and happy Easter. What we do together in our services on Easter is I'll say, He is risen, and we respond by saying, He is risen indeed. So let me say it, He is risen, He is risen indeed. It's a celebration today. Uh, it's the joy of our life. In fact, we're going to be talking about that today. The resurrection, what it means, its significance, its impact in our life. How does it mark the life of a believer? Um, every day we live and breathe is, is and ought to be a reflection that Jesus Christ is alive today. That he's risen from the dead. And so for the believer in the life of a believer, people should see, I should see, we should see that Jesus Christ is living in us. There's a change. There is impact. There is Christ making a difference every day. He is risen. He's not here, just as he said. He's alive. Last week was Palm Sunday. We focused on uh, just an emphasis that comes out of that reality. It was a day really of shattered expectations. As Jesus came into Jerusalem, everyone who was a participant in that day had expectations on Christ for what he would do, when he would do it. Those who had good expectations still did, still had expectations according to their own timetable, not God's. Those There were many who had uh, selfish expectations from the disciples all the way to the religious leaders to Pilate and Herod and everyone in between, all the people. It was a day where God broke down all of the expectations of man and revealed them to be insufficient, to be empty, and revealed himself to be the answer, the solution, the provision to the expectations that we have in life. That's fulfilled today on Easter. That's fulfilled today as we worship his resurrection. And so it's powerful, it's significant. That shattered expectation in our life that we embrace all the time, that we we have to deal with all the time, it, God turns that into living hope. That's what he does. Life-changing hope. That's what he does. I want to focus on that today. I want today to be a, a message of, a, of celebration, a message of transformation, because it's a reflection of Jesus Christ in us, our living Savior, who is alive. We ended last week, Palm Sunday, with this verse, or Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope, he infuses us, he fills our life with hope. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. That's, that's the promise of God to his people. That's the promise that, that we lay before our hearts this morning. God has given us hope in Jesus Christ, a hope that is living, a hope that is abundant, it is, it is realized through faith in Jesus Christ. It is empowered by the Holy Spirit in our life. It comes alive. We then are able to abound, to overflow with the reality of the hope that we have in Christ. And so I want us to look at, at, a, at a promise that comes out of this reality of the resurrection of Jesus' ministry to his disciples and to us as church. The promise is this, that God is with us. We're going to see that in our text today. God is with us. God's with you today. He's with us in this world today. He is sovereign. He is in charge. He's ruling. He's reigning. God will be with you. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, we see that. Why? Based on what? His resurrection. Let's look at that. Let's look at this promise. This is the promise today from which we, it's a springboard for where we're going today. The promise is rooted in the resurrection. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come back to you. You're not, you're not going to be without relationship, without mother, without father, without God. You are going to have me in your life. Because I live, you will also live. He who loves me, I will love him and reveal myself to him, manifest myself to him, be in relationship to him. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. Promise, promise, promise. I am with you. I will be with you. That's the promise that comes out of the resurrection today. Every day we live and breathe, he is with us. Jesus Christ is. The promise is revealed in the very name of Christ. His name. It is in his name. The virgin Mary shall conceive. You shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. I love that name for our church. It is a reminder to me constantly that God is with us as believers, as a church. To you, God is with you. That's the promise today. It flows out of the power, the reality of the resurrection. It is indeed power. Romans 15, I am sure that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing at all can separate us from that relationship. That is power. He is always with us. Nothing can separate us from that. Life, 
death nor life or angels or rulers or things present or things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And it's permanent. Nothing can separate us. Power over all of these things, it is permanent. I will be with you. The promise is rooted in the dwelling of Jesus Christ. Do you not know that you are God's temple, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, and that God's Spirit dwells in you. Jesus Christ dwells in the life of a believer through the Spirit of God. The character of Christ is brought to life in us through the Spirit of God. Fulfilling His promise, why? Because He is alive. God is with us. I will be with you. The promise is sweet. It's, it's fellowship, John 14. He says to the disciples, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him. We will come to him and make our home with him. See, that's what he's doing. Anytime anyone receives Jesus Christ as Savior, Jesus comes into our life, into your life, into that life, and he makes makes himself at home in our life. Fellowship, sweet power, relationship, God's very presence in you and in us. It is an ailment for every day, each day, Isaiah 41.10. We don't have to be afraid. God says, I'm with you. See, that doesn't mean anything if he hasn't risen from the dead. Because he has, it means everything in the world. Don't be dismayed. I'm your God. I'm with you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous, with my right, right hand. That right hand is a symbol of power. Have you known a weakness this week? Have you needed God's help this week? Have you needed Him to just hold you and, and, and be strength to you? Then that's just a reminder and a reality of God's presence in our life, that He enables us to do what we can't do. It's because of the resur- resurrection that it's true. The resurrection, that promise, the power of that just keeps giving in our life every day that we live and breathe. I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though he die yet, shall he live. Not even after death, but living as we die to self, die to sin, die to Christ, that we might live for him. We live every day in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's with us. Why? Because he rose from the dead. Philippians 3.10. I want to know, the believer says, I want to know you. Lord, I want to know you. Paul says, I want to know you. I want to know that power. I want to know the power of the resurrection. It means nothing if he didn't come out of that grave. Romans 6, 4. Because he did come out of that grave, because he's alive, we are able to walk in newness of life, brand new in Jesus Christ. I want to go to today's text. Today's text builds on the hope that we have in Christ, the fruit that comes out of that hope into our life. I want us to look at that fruit today, the reality of that today. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. This is when resurrection power becomes real in our life. When Jesus Christ what he did on the cross, what he did in victory and rising out of the grave to victory, what he did, this is where that becomes real in our life, in my life, every day. It's when that power, the presence of God becomes real in my life. That resurrection power becomes real in the life of a believer when, when certain things take place. That's what our text is all about today. Philippians chapter 4, take your Bible, turn there, Philippians chapter 4, we're going to be in verses 4 through 9. That power is real in our life when there's when there is relationship. It's it starts it starts with Jesus Christ. It starts with him. Verse verse four, we see this. We are to rejoice in the Lord. It is it is in the Lord that is the key there. It begins with Christ, it ends with Christ, it is in relationship with Christ. If we're gonna know the power that changes our life, it starts with relationship. That power is is real in our life when there is a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus Christ as Savior, you are in relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior, then there is the reality of His power at work in your life. That is key. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The one who is in Jesus Christ, we will rejoice in the Lord. In the Lord is the key, that preposition. It is a relationship. It is in the Lord that we, that we have anything. It is in the Lord that we have hope. It's in the Lord that we have the fruit that we're going to talk about, that we experience the power of the resurrection. If anyone's in Christ, he's a brand new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. In him, we become right with God. We become the righteousness of God. It is in Christ, in relationship with him. If I'm not in relationship with Christ, if I'm not a child of God, then this is not a reality for my life. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. God has blessed us 
in Jesus Christ with every spiritual blessing in, in, in the heavenly places where, where Christ is now. As he blesses us, he blesses his children. We are in relationship and we benefit from the power of the resurrection every day, the power of his blessing in our life every day. And I encourage you, every day we are blessed in relationship with Jesus Christ. John chapter 15, verse 4. As we abide in Jesus Christ, he abides in us. As we remain in Jesus Christ, as we place our trust in him, as we as we remain under his, his will, his influence, his strength, his power, he abides in us. He, he pours and invests his power, his strength into our life, which is power, which we saw, and it's permanent. Ephesians chapter 1, the plan of God is this, is to unite everything, all things in heaven and earth, to Jesus Christ. Those things which will be united to him will be those things which have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, made fresh by the power of Jesus Christ. All of man who has lived in disobedience and rejected the, the good news of the gospel will not be a part of this uniting to Jesus Christ. It is power because of the resurrection. Now, Philippians, he says here in verse 4, we're to rejoice in the Lord. It's relationship. Paul's life was all about relationship. We've got to remember the context of this, of this book that he writes, this book of Philippians. It's a prisoner in Rome. That's what we see. This is one of the prison epistles. You have Colossians. You have, a, you have a, uh, Ephesians. You have Philippians. You have Philemon. These are these are prison epistles. He's writing them from prison. That's the reality. He's been wrongfully arrested. Uh, he's been shipwrecked. He's been he's been bitten by a snake, a poisonous thing. He would have died except for God's intervention, right? Um, he was placed under house arrest. And all of this, we see the reality of his relationship to Christ. We see the conclusion of his life by his commitment. What he's what, the conclusion, the reality of his life is this: he's committed to Christ. He's united to Jesus Christ. He's yielded to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is his foundation, is his rock. Why? Because he's alive. Because he encountered the resurrected Savior. Because he's in relationship. And this morning, you and I can experience that same thing. And so he tells us here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4. That's what he says. That joy is, is not in ourselves. It's not, it's not accomplished in our achievements. It's not accomplished through our own effort. It's not accomplished through the experiences of life that we might have. The joy is power. It's the power of God in our life. It's the power of God over our circumstances. It's the power of God over the setbacks that we might have in life. It's the power of God over our temperament, over the way God's made us. It is God's provision for us. That is key. So we're told to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. So resurrection power, it's real in our life when we are in relationship with Jesus Christ. If, if I'm not a child of God, then that's the first step I need to take. That's the first step you need to take, to receive Jesus Christ as Savior, to confess your need, your sin before the Lord, to say, Lord, I want your provision, your cleansing. I want your power in my life. I want you to change me, transform me, make me like you. Lord, I want to follow after you. I recognize you are Savior of this world. I recognize you are the one who saves us from our sins. I want you in my life, over my life. That's where it starts. But that power comes alive when there's two elements that are very important in this passage, and that's what I want to focus on this morning. Number one, when there's joy. The power of the resurrection is, is visible and real in the life of any believer when there's joy in the life of that believer. The powerful testimony of a believer is the power of God in their life, is when God is changing our life. When he changes us, he changes our heart. When he changes us, he's doing the work in our heart first. One of, the, one of the significant fruits that come out of our life is the joy of the Lord. Paul says in the circumstances of his life, having known punishment and beatings and all that has been a part of his ministry, he says to the church churches, and, he's, and he reflects from his own life, rejoice, be glad in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at the text. The power of God is real in our life when there's joy. It's reflected in, in these ways. Number one, we see in verse four, reflect, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He says it twice. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Imperative, command, right? Let, verse five, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. You know, when, when life is difficult, when life is hard, 
because God has promised it's going to be fiery trials, tribulations. He's promised we're going to go through those. When it's hard, the fruit of the Spirit of God, the fruit of the reality of the resurrection comes alive in the life of a believer. We're able to express a, a gentleness to the people around me no matter what's going on in my life. That's only by the Spirit of God. You and I, we, we just can't do that in our life on our own. We don't have the ability to have a gentleness of a disposition of heart towards all others when sin is impacting us and affecting us. Jesus says, take my yoke and learn from me. My yoke is easy. I'm gentle. I'm humble in heart, he says. He reminds us. He always exhibited power, his power, divine power under control as he served and as he ministered. He gives that same ability to us to have a gentleness of spirit. The joy of the Lord is the, is the means for that gentle spirit. You and I are able to have a gentleness towards others in our life, maybe difficult others, difficult people. And we're able to have that kind of gentleness and humility towards others, even a willingness to give up rights, whatever that might be, as Paul did, as he served the Lord, as we do, as we serve the Lord, because of the joy of the Lord. That's the key, is the joy of the Lord. So he reminds us here in verse, four, in verse 5, because of the joy of the Lord, we're able to express a... Uh, a gentleness, a humbleness to others in our life because we are yielded to Jesus Christ. Another thing that he says here is also in verse 5. He says, the Lord is at hand. That's a reminder to us. We're able to have joy in Jesus Christ because of the presence of God in our life. He is at hand. He's with us all of the time. You know what? He's with you in power. You and I are able to, to express and to experience and to know from our heart and express in our life the joy of the Lord because he's with us. Not only is he with us, he has promised to come again. The Lord is at hand, it says here. That is his presence, but it's also his promise that the, that the coming of the Lord is coming. It's short. It can happen at any time. You kind of have two things being reflected there. We're reminded of that. We're reminded in John that no one has seen God at any time, but Jesus Christ has has revealed him to us. That's the presence of God in our life. An ongoing awareness of the presence of God in our life. Also in verse 5, we, we see this as we continue. And he reads, Paul says, Rejoice, be gentle, be reasonable to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Anxiety is, is one of the great marks, markers of our culture. Stress in our, in our culture is so high. We all experience that stress. We know that stress. It seems like the more we know, the more we have at our fingertips, fingertips, instead of life being easier, it gets more stressful. Anxiety is a reality of life. We see that here. It reminds us that when we are experiencing joy in Christ, who He is, what He's done for us, that is power in our life over the anxiety of life. Temptation, Trials, testings, creates anxiety in our life. Jesus Christ comes into those anxieties. He comes into those tests. He comes into those moments, and He produces the ability to have joy. Uh, to, to trust Jesus Christ, He overcomes the anxiety of our heart. We're going to see how He does that. That's important to see. You know, Peter, when he was on the water, when he took that step and he walked towards Jesus, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, that's when anxiety overwhelmed him. It's the same thing's true in our life. When we take our eyes off of the Lord and put our eyes on the people that are making our life difficult or our barriers in our life, or we take our, put our eyes on the circumstances that, that are out of our control, then we, anxiety just, just floods our life. When we keep our eyes on the Lord, when I keep my eyes on the Lord, there's a joy that comes from knowing I'm in the hands of God, in the presence of God, under the power of God. Joy comes from that. And then he also continues as he, as he writes to us, Paul says this, don't be anxious about anything. You know, I, and, unless Paul understands the reality of the power of Christ in our life, how could he write those words? See, he has experienced that firsthand. He believes by faith the very power of God in our life. And so he can write those words accurately and truthfully. They can be applied to our life. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. When there's joy in the life of a believer, 
another reality is there is that our life is is committed to the pattern of prayer. It flows from a, a powerful prayer life uh, in the life of a believer. The disciples would come to Jesus and they would say to Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray with power. Teach us how to pray motivated by and grounded in faith towards you. And he would say to them at the before they went to the, he went to the cross, watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. He didn't do that. Prayer is the key, it's a catalyst. And it's, just, it's the key to joy. When I bring my prayers and my needs, my supplications to him, and, I'm, and, and I bring uh, thanks to Jesus Christ about where I'm at in the moment, before he's figured out all the answers for me, even though he knows them, before I know all the answers, before, before I have things figured out and can see things the way he does, I'm able to give thanks to him because of the joy of my trust in Jesus Christ. Because he rose from the dead, he can handle my circumstance. He can handle my heart. He can handle the people in my life. And so, and so he gives me the ability to experience and to know joy. This leads us ultimately to the reality of peace in our life. The reality of peace. We're going to see that here in verse 7. You know, peace is a powerful thing. We've got two pictures here. You know, the one, the one on, the, on your left... When we think of peace, that's what we think of. I mean, it might not be exactly what you think of. Just being out here, being being on, on, on still waters, uh, in a kayak, uh, surrounded by mountains, glaciers, the, the, the peacefulness of the solitude, of quiet, being reminded of God, uh, not being near a phone, having quietness, just... When we think of peace, we think of things like this. We think of moments that bring us pleasure. We think of places that make us feel good and comfortable. When God speaks of peace, this is part of it. The blessings of God in our life are part of it. The leading a sheep to green pastures is part of it. But the peace of God, biblically, is also a significant other thing. It's this other side. It's, it's being in the middle of a storm. It's being in the middle of doubts, conflicts of the heart. It's being in the middle of difficult people and circumstances. It's being caught up in things I can't control. It's not being able to see the end. And yet, put my eyes on Christ and trust Him and know that He's my rock and He's my foundation. You see, like this lighthouse, there'll come a time when that storm here that's, that's in our life, it's going to pass. Why? Because that lighthouse is grounded on the foundation of the rock that it stands on. The believer is grounded in relationship to Jesus Christ. Why? Because He's alive. And so we experience joy and peace. And then when that storm is passed, the beauty of what we're able to see and to experience and to be in that lighthouse and to see all the beauty around it after the storm is passed. What happens sometimes, though, in the life of a believer is, yes, the storm is swirling around us and hits us, but often, often when we are not in a place of enjoying God and enjoying Jesus Christ, we are the storm in people's life. We lash out to others. People are afraid to touch us, to get close to us, because we are the storm. But if I trust Jesus Christ, and I lay my faith in Him, I keep my eyes on Him, then I am able to experience the joy of God and the peace of God. And so, that reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the power of that resurrection becomes real through relationship. It becomes real through the joy of the Lord. It's His joy. And it becomes real through the peace of God. So we see here in verse 7, Let your request be made known to God and the peace of God. We have peace. God brings peace into our life. That's the reality. See, when there's peace, Paul shows us some things that are true in our life. One is, it is God's work in our life. It is, it is the peace, verse 7, of God. It's His peace. That's what it's all about. Um, it's not something that, that uh, circumstances dictates. It's not, a, it's not a peace that, that comes from experience or where I'm at. It's not a peace because everything is right in my life and I'm out in that kayak and I'm all alone. Because you know what? When I step back from that experience back into life, if that's all I have, that's not peace. That was a moment in time. That was a pleasant moment in time. That was a peaceful moment in time. But it was not a biblically peaceful moment in the sense that if, if that's the only thing that I'm relying upon for stability in my life, then that stability will be washed away. It's, it's sand when it comes to the circumstances and the storms of life. It's Jesus Christ that I need to have my peace in, place my faith in, my trust in. 
It is a product of his work in my life. Let the peace of Christ rule rule in your life. We are told by God's word. Not only that, Paul continues, and he says, It is the peace, it is the peace of God. It is from him. It's not explainable, which surpasses all understanding, he says. You know what? I can experience it and I have. You can experience it and you have. But to explain it to someone who's never experienced it, only by faith, applying faith, only by God opening the eyes of faith in the heart of an individual can they see from the Word of God the reality of the peace of God. Jesus reminded his disciples, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. He he would remind them, don't be troubled and don't be afraid. I'm going to give you a peace that the world can't produce, that the world can't replicate. There is no... There is, there is no alternative to my peace. If you want peace, it's found in me. That's, a, that's important to see and to understand. He says, it is the peace of God. It surpasses all understanding. But when we experience it, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. It is the most settling, restful reality in the life of a believer. To know that God's in control. No matter what the storm is in our life, there's, there's a peacefulness in our heart. No matter what's swirling around in our life, in my mind, there's a peacefulness. It says here in verse 7 that that peace will, will be a guard in our life. It stands as a guard over our life. Jesus Christ, when he prayed to his Father in John 17, he says, I have kept all of the disciples, except one, Judas, the son of perdition, who was not, who was not a child of God. He reminds us that He keeps us. Jude chapter Jude 24 reminds us that He keeps us from falling. He keeps us from stumbling. He's going to present us faultless before His glorious throne. Jesus Christ keeps us every day. He guards us. He watches over our life and over our heart with what? His peace. He gives us peace that's unexplainable in every moment through all of the fiery trials, through all the tests and the temptations. That's what He does. He gives us peace. That He's in control. That He has He's given us everything that we need for life, for godliness. He is a guard in our life. Not only is he a guard, but also in verse 7 we see this. He guards your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, I think I think that's probably the most vulnerable, vulnerable area in our life. It's internal. You know, we are vulnerable to things that happen to us. But we're vulnerable because we lose the battle in our mind. We're vulnerable to those things that happen to us because... What happens in the mind? What happens in the heart? It affects our emotions. It affects our the way we th- see ourselves, the way we perceive God and our circumstances. We are vulnerable. Yet at the same time, when we are weak, He is strong. And what, he, what Jesus does here is, is it guards the heart and the mind. He brings His strength into our heart, into our mind. That's what He does. We were reminded in Scripture, the psalmist said this, My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I will fail. You will fail. It's a given. It's a guarantee. But you know what? When we fail, we are exactly where we need to be. We recognize, Lord, I don't have to fail because you're my strength. And he gives us a peace to trust him, to take a step of faith, to apply his character into our life, to be reasonable, to be gentle to others. He gives us the ability to live Christ out because there is a peace that everything's okay, that it will be worth it all, that I can trust him. That's what he shows us. That's what he wants us to see. The peace is grounded in Jesus Christ who rose from the dead. The peace is grounded in the promises of God's word. Joy and peace go together. They are from God. They are internal. They are the work of God, the product of God, the fruit of God in our life. How important that is. We are vulnerable. And so we need to continue to do, well, we're going to see that here in just a second. (laughs) Okay, let's look at that in a second. So, what else do we see in this text? We see the reality of what we need to do. Verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable or respectable, be respectful. Whatever is just, in other words, do the right thing. Whatever is right, do the right thing. Whatever is pure, uh, motives, have the right motives as you do and live and breathe. Whatever is pure, moral purity, sexual purity, uh, Whatever is pure, biblically, according to God's word, whatever is lovely, um, whatever is, is kind, whatever is not ugly, do we ever ugly towards others in the way that we live and breathe and treat others? Whatever is lovely, whatever is, is commendable, 
That's our, our behavior. It's our character. Whatever is, is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's any worthy of praise, think about these things. Peace is a reality in the life of a believer. When, when this is a reality, this, is, this produces the peace of God in our life as well. The Word of God. When our mind is trained on the character of Jesus Christ, when our mind is trained on, on the Word of God, there is peace in our life because it reflects that we have been trained by His Word. We've been trained by His character. We are conforming our life to the character of Christ. We're being trained by the Word of God. We're thinking on those things which, which will motivate, inspire, and draw us to this one goal, to love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength, and all of our mind, and to be able to then love others, our neighbor as ourselves. When we, are, when, we are, when we are drawn to Jesus Christ, we experience the joy of that relationship. We experience the peace of being in Christ, being strengthened in Christ, being equipped and enabled in Christ. That comes from our thought life. It comes from being grounded in God's Word, thinking, thinking His thoughts that draw us into worship, that draw us into praise, that draw us into reflecting upon Him. Verse 8 is a reminder to us of the essential key of the Word of God to peace in your life and mine. So many believers don't have the joy and the peace of the Lord because they're never in the Word of God. Because your experience, when, as, as Peter took his eyes off of Jesus Christ, he took his eyes off of the living Word. When we take our eyes off of Christ, when we take our eyes away from the Word of God, we, we don't have the power of the living Word in our life. And so we sink just as Peter did. When we keep our eyes focused on Him, we experience the joy and the peace of God. How important that is. We are reminded, the Scripture tells us in Isaiah 26, you keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Why? Why do we keep our mind focused on Him, stayed on Him? Because we trust Him. Isaiah 26, 3. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 reminds us that we're to take every, every thought in captivity to Jesus Christ. Every thought in obedience to Jesus Christ. Every thought were to bring it into obedience. Every thought is to be in harmony with verse 8. We're to think thoughts that are that are reflective of Jesus Christ in our life. That bring us to this one goal, to love God, to love Him with everything, and to then be able to love others. Because we are so loved by God, it enables that love to, to flourish from our life. It's it's revealed in the joy that we have in our relationship. It's, re, it's revealed in the peace that we have no matter what's going on. It's because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's why. That's why. When there's peace, there's another reality that's true in our life as well. Look at verse 9. We're going to finish here with verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Paul lifts himself up as an example here. The peace of God is a reality in our life when it's reinforced by others in your life who also love the Lord. You know, we're not an island. Jesus Christ is enough for all of us. If we have to take a stand by ourselves, Jesus Christ is sufficient. If God calls you to take a stand all by yourself, He will be sufficient in your life. But He also created Eve to go with Adam. He's created us to need companionship. He's created us to need others. And He's created us to benefit from the encouragement of others who walk with the Lord. This is all about receiving encouragement from others, looking at the lives of others and being motivated by their example, learning from their example, saying, I want those kind of people in my life. I, I don't want people in my life as influencers. They're going to they're gonna draw me away from Christ. They're going to pull me away from faith, from the walk of faith. I don't want people that are going to undermine my commitment to Jesus Christ and the power of His resurrection. I don't want those kind of people investing in my life. I want to love them. I want to be a testimony to them. I want to be influencers in their life. I want to be difference makers in their life. But I don't want them to be influencers in my walk in the sense that they might pull me away from Jesus Christ. Paul says, if you want to walk with the Lord, look at my life. Paul's not holding himself up here as perfect. Over and over again, he reveals his weakness, his inability on his own. That it's only through Jesus Christ. But he also is aware that Jesus Christ has been powerful in his life and testimony, has transformed him. And so he writes with a, with a genuineness and authenticity of heart. If you look at my life, I believe you'll see Christ. And of course, under the inspiration of Scripture, these words are true and accurate. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, Walk with the wise and you'll become wise. 
bad company c corrupts good character we see here in, in Proverbs as well. 1 Corinthians 15.33. These are the realities of life. And so we need to keep our eyes focused on those who will help us to walk faithfully in Jesus Christ. Be drawn to them so that you might be like Christ. Paul says, whatever you've learned and received, not just heard with your ears, but, but seen me do. And received means not, I've not just heard it, I'm putting it into practice. And seen me practice these things. The peace of God is a reality in my life when, when there is obedience in my life and follow through. Paul reminds all of us to put into practice the principles of God's word. That's what's in his life. Christ is in his life. Putting the principles of day-to-day of -day faith into action in our life. We need to do that. That's obedience. That's follow through. As you learn and feed on God's word, then it needs to be poured into your life in practice and application. That's the reality. When that happens, the peace of God becomes a reality in your life and in mine. Paul, uh, Jesus said to the disciples, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That relationship is peace producing. That relationship is joy producing. And then we see this reality as well. The things you've you've heard, you've learned and received, and you've heard and you've seen in me. Practice these things. Put them into practice. Put them into your life. The principles of God's word. Put them into your life. By faith, apply them. Live them. And the God of peace will be with you. There's our promise. God says, "I'll be with you." Not only that, I will be the God of peace in your life. When you and I are are following Him, pursuing Him, loving Him with all of our soul heart and soul and strength and mind. We are committed to loving others with that kind of love. It's because we are in God's Word, grounded in His Word. We are in relationship. When that's the reality, then the promise becomes fruit in my life. I'm able to experience the joy and the peace of God. The joy and the peace. He says here at the end of this verse, the God of peace will be with you. Not just peace with you, but the God of peace, Jesus Christ who rose from the dead, in the Spirit of God, in the power of the Word of God will be in your life and mine in power. How important that is. It takes us back to this promise, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, Matthew chapter 28. Emmanuel, the very name of Jesus Christ, is God with us. I just want to, I just want to remind all of us who are believers, who know and love Jesus Christ, the fruit of that relationship, if it's real, will be the joy of the Lord. It will be the peace of the Lord. I am burdened over, I pray over those that I minister to and serve and love who have lost that joy and lost that peace. And, and at times appear to be rudderless in their, in their walk with the Lord. When we come back to Jesus Christ and we remember what He did in power, that's what He's able to, to duplicate, replicate in your life. And in mine, he's able to bring that power into my life and to change me. He's able to he's able to over, overcome the weaknesses of, of my temperament. He's able to overcome the circumstances that, that control me. He's able to overcome the setbacks, the failures I've had in life. He's able to be that rock, so that like that lighthouse, no matter what storm comes into my life, what what comes out of my life is the peace of God. What comes out of my life is the joy of the Lord. Not the joy of the storm, it's the joy of what God is producing in the storm. Not the joy of difficult people, it's the joy of the opportunity that difficult people are in my life. Not the joy of, of fiery trials and adversity, but it's the joy of what God is producing in my life through those things. If I don't believe God, I won't, I won't trust Him enough to let Him bring joy into my life. If I try to do it on my own, if I try to control my life, I'll never experience by releasing myself to Christ, I'll never experience the joy of the Lord. The peace of God. Do you believe in the resurrection? He is not here. He is risen just as He said. Do you believe that? Do you and I believe that? When we practice faith in Him every day, we put that into action. When joy and peace are the fruit of our life, the fruit of the Spirit of God in our life, then faith is real. The resurrection is real. Is this fruit a reality in your life? Is joy and peace a reality in your life? Do your children see it? Does your church see it? Do your neighbors see it? Do you see it in your own heart? 
Are you experiencing what God has promised? That's the promise to you. It may be that we just need to settle our heart with the Lord and say, Lord, I've allowed myself to become overwhelmed. I've allowed myself to try to be in control of everything in my life. I've not yielded myself to you. I've not reminded myself that, God, you're in control. And God, you love me, and you've given me everything that I need. God, my prayer is that you would overwhelm me again with your love. Overwhelm me with your presence. Overwhelm me with the reality of your joy and of your peace. God, change me. God, I need to repent. I need to turn from things that have just been a bondage and been a grip on my life. I need to let those go and confess those things and release them to you and say, Lord, you be the victory in my life, in my heart. You take those things and you produce the fruit of the Spirit. You produce the fruit of joy and the fruit of peace. That's what I'm praying for this Easter. That in your life and mine, you'll just know the blessing of the joy of the Lord and the peace of God. That'll be power. That'll be transformative in your life. What, is, what a wonderful thing to celebrate. What a wonderful thing to keep our eyes focused on. That Jesus Christ is able because he rose from the dead. May that be your testimony and your power. I want to invite you back next week. We're going to step back into the book of Revelation next week. Jesus Christ is transforming. His transformative work continues every day. In Revelation, we step into this reality, the need to live in view of the day of the Lord, the great day of the Lord. We're going to step back into Revelation chapter 6. We're going to start moving forward in this book again. It's a reminder to us of the need for our testimony, our light, for Jesus Christ to be real and alive. May you join us. May God bless your heart this morning, your life this morning, by touching you with the Spirit of God, that you and I might experience the joy and the peace of God. Thank you for joining with us. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed.